Morning, everyone. Morning. So glad you all are out here. Uh, sorry you're seeing me on stage one more time. Uh, I know it's been, a, it's been a lot of me. It's been a lot of me. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how I made it back up here and here, like, what, nine hours later, 12 hours later from, uh, from being here last night. Uh, but I'm so glad to be seeing all of you again. And I'm so glad to be on such an important panel with uh, literally some heroes of mine, uh, Gene Bauer, uh, Bruce Friedrich, and Eric Meyer. I, uh, I, I think I met Gene Bauer on this stage uh, like five years ago, right? Uh, we were having a little spirited uh, debate about effective tactics. Uh, somehow we mostly agree now, so I guess these debates maybe can be uh, useful and meaningful. And uh, what I want to talk about is, even though we are winning, and even though we're doing great things, uh, there, there, is, there is a problem. It's not a problem, but there is a, a big opportunity to see it as. And uh, so I want to imagine, or have everyone here imagine, that they are a business owner. And you have just come up with a new product. Make it whatever you want. This is, this is your mind right here. Your new product, and it starts flying. It starts selling really well. You're doing a great job. You feel you have all these new customers. You feel you're doing a really good job. Um, and then you notice that even though you keep seeing all these new customers, uh, you're seeing them come in you're not actually uh, seeing the returns. <clears throat> and when you realize, you want to wonder, are more than half of my customers just going away, coming back, not even actually staying with me? So you do a little market research, you do a little research, and as the numbers come in, you realize it's a little worse than you thought. Now you're realizing it actually might be more like three out of four. Three out of four of your customers are leaving. They're, they're coming in once, but they're not coming back. And so you did a little deeper. So you're going to do a huge study, huge market research on this, massive. And you think it's probably you can split the difference. So it can't be three out of four. Hopefully it's not even one out of two. And it's even worse than you thought. What you find out, that five out of six of your customers are not coming back. They're walking in the door once, but they're not coming back the second time. <laughs> and if that was the reality, right? If that's what you found out as a business owner, that'd be a, a big deal, right? Like, like a really big deal. <laughs> um, and that actually is. So take ourselves out of this business mode. That's the reality uh, in many ways for farm animals right now. Uh, we've been suspecting for a long time there's a problem with vegan retention that people who go vegan don't stay vegan. And the number uh, was suspected was somewhere between one out of two and three out of four people who try to go vegetarian and vegan don't stay that way. And uh, earlier this year, Faunalytics, formerly known as the Human Research Council, uh, released the largest study ever done on this, over 11,000 people using a professional polling agency, by far the most comprehensive study ever done on this, and they found that five out of six people who explore a vegetarian or vegan diet don't say vegetarian or vegan. That's a huge problem, right? I mean, that's a huge problem. That means that every time we have these fantastic, effective conversations that Bruce has been te teaching us to have, there is an 84% chance that we're not going to have that lifelong efficacy, that lifelong doubling that Bruce talked about, unless we learn how to get people not just to care once, not just to go vegan, but also how to get them to stay vegan. And so there's a lot of ways that we can do this, and there's no way to get to nearly all of them today. But I'm going to try to go through uh, quickly five things that I hope can make us as a movement better at not just making that first step, not just making that connection, but getting people to stick with it. Uh, the first is that consistently, uh, oh, I'm actually different. I want to say, oh, sorry, I did forget something all. Uh, one of the things I want to say is we're talking about this progress, right? And we talk about, um, we hear all this conference that 400 million fewer animals are being slaughtered today than were 10 years ago, which is massive, huge progress. There is no way to even mentally wrap our heads around how great of news that is. But if we were doing a much better job, right, that number, I mean, that number, if we were keeping all these people who were eating less animals, that number could be 1 billion pure animals every single year slaughtered. That number could be 2 billion animals, different. 2 billion fewer animals slaughtered every year compared to 10 years ago. So with that, that's where these uh, five tools I have, I hope, are going to be effective in letting us realize how massive this problem is, but also how massive the opportunity is. Literally, just with simple little tools, maybe saving billions more animals than we currently are. Uh, so the first thing is that people who uh, revert back on veganism consistently say that cost and convenience are the biggest barriers for them. They say that they see veganism as inconvenient and expensive. Now, it doesn't matter if we think that's true or not, right? We could say 
and especially with college kids, we hear this all the time with college kids, we can say, we know you're running up huge bar tabs every single night, right? Uh, we, know, we know what you're doing with your money. Uh, why can't you spend like 50 cents more on tofurkey uh, instead of you know, the factory farm turkey you're getting at the, at the you know, school's deli mart, which is jacked up prices anyway? We know that you know, maybe these aren't uh, actually as big of concerns as they say they are, but they think they are. They feel important to them. And so it's up to us, it's not up to us to convince them that they should spend 50 cents more for tofurkey as they, as they should for uh, factory farm turkey, even though they should, you know they should, right? It's up to us as a movement to do things to make it so the same places they're already going to get their food have, uh, have the same options for the same price. And that's why it's so great uh, that, you know, Compassion for Killing and Erica is working to get Subway to add vegan options all over. <laughs> I'm so proud to say that Farm was uh, the leader of a coalition to get Ben and Jerry's this year to commit in one year to all the Because we know that the youth are the most important demographic to reach, is why I think the Humane League's work to get uh, campus providers to add vegan options is really super critical and super important and super effective. Uh, we need as a movement to make it so that when people walk in the place they're already getting food, they can choose the vegan option with the same ease and the same price, and they can choose the non-vegan option. When that happens, far, far fewer people are going to choose the cool option when the uncool option is just as available. Uh, so that's one, that's one thing. Uh, the second one is the pacing. Uh, so this, this big study by Farmalytics on vegan retention found that those who went vegan quickly were far more likely to backslide than those who went vegan slowly. Now this was a causation, or sorry, a correlation, not a causation, so it's possible there's some other factor going in there, but given the decades of psycholog psychological research already showing that people who make small steps are more likely to make big changes later, I think we have an obligation to seriously take this into account, to seriously think about the fact that someone going vegan instantly might actually be worse for animals than someone going vegan more slowly. Uh, so just think, just keep that in mind when someone when someone maybe frustrates you and they're going slowly when they're still you know eating a little bit of dairy now and then and they call it cheating you know I mean we obviously we don't want to let them cheat forever eventually we need to get these you know get our friends get our family get our loved ones get people reaching uh, to fully ditch animal products both in their diets and their entire lifestyles but the pacing can actually the slow pacing can help animals more than it hurts them uh, and so with that slow pacing uh, people often this is the, the third item I have. Uh, people often ask, well, I'm not going to go vegan right away. What should I do, right? Uh, should I look for the least factory farm meat? Uh, should I cut out beef first? Uh, should I cut out pork first? And if all animals uh, were killed in the same numbers rate, it wouldn't matter that much which animal product to cut out first. Uh, but the fact that so many people cut out red meat first uh, could very possibly be doing more harm to animals than it's doing good to animals. Uh, because the reality is that almost every single animal that we as society kill for food are birds and fish. Almost every single one of them. If you look at a pie chart of, of the percentages of animals raised and killed for food, over 99% are chickens and fish. Uh, and the cows and pigs, because they're so large, they produce so much more meat, they actually make up a sliver of the number of animals being raised and killed for food. And so I tell anyone, the first thing I tell someone who says they're not going to go vegan right away, I say cut your chicken and fish consumption in half, and you're basically cutting your animal cruelty in half. So that's a really, really super easy one. Uh, that's, you know, if, if they're going to go slowly anyway, you might as well make sure that they're going slowly uh, and in the right direction, basically. They're helping the most amount of animals immediately and the smaller amount of animals later, rather than doing the opposite. Rather than cutting up beef, replacing it with chicken, and actually killing more animals every year than they were when they didn't even think of themselves as a quasi-vegetarian. Uh, the next item is moving into more modern communication methods as a movement. So we put a lot of effort into refining our leaflets. Farm does the same thing. It's great. Uh, but studies of college kids are showing that they don't get their information from written uh, materials often anymore. The two ways they want to learn things are from social media and from videos. And that's actually great news for us, especially social media, because it's such an easy way, right, to interact with people on a regular basis all the time. And so we can use the social media as a constant re-engagement, a constant re-engagement. So if someone says they're interested in going vegan once, it's a way that we can get them forever, basically. Constantly be replanting these ideas for them, constantly be giving them tools on how to go vegan, constantly giving them reminders of why to go vegan. Social media is the best tool we can possibly have with this. And it works perfectly because it's what they want, uh, they mean the general public, and it's what we want, which is to reach them all the time. 
Uh, similarly with, uh, with videos, we're finding uh, that people are far more likely to, to make changes because they saw a video the first time uh, that makes them want to go vegetarian or vegan, but they also want to use videos as a way to keep learning the, uh, the next steps, basically. Rather than just get a vegan starter guide on paper, they would like you know, this information in video form. And so Forum uh, just released last week a video called How Human Lied To. It's an animated video that we're testing across the country. And if this video is successful at getting people to consider going why vegan, we're looking at developing an animated how series uh, using one of the most esteemed educational animated video companies in the world. Uh, but I hope that in general we consider videos as a much more uh, effective tool for getting people to get this second level education uh, than merely just printed materials. And uh, the final item, is uh, the final thing that makes people start reducing their interest in veganism is that they, uh, they basically just lose interest in the issues. Is what felt really urgent and important to them when they first learned that information, they first saw that factory farm yeah. multi video, it impacted them, they say, yes, I'm going to go vegetarian, yes, I'm going to go vegan. A few months later, the impact is just worn off. You know, we're bombarded with messages all the time, right? I mean, we see how many advertisements for meat do we see every single day? How many advertisements for dairy? How many advertisements for eggs? Seeing one factory farm video one time, unfortunately, just doesn't have the lifelong impact that we want it to, even though we probably all in this room think that it should. And this is actually uh, a pretty great thing for us in many ways, uh, because what this means is that people to not just go vegan, but stay vegan, they don't just need a simple why once, they need to own the entire animal ethic. What the data shows is that when people care more about farm animals, regardless of why they went vegan the first time, whether they went vegan for health, whether they went vegan for the environment, whether they went vegan for factory farm cruelties, the thing that keeps them staying vegan is owning the belief that slaughtering animals is just wrong to begin with. And so, I think this is a really wonderful, beautiful thing, because sometimes we hear about debates between pragmatism, practicality, and philosophy. And our movement is going in the direction where, in general, we're saying that being practical is more important than being philosophically pure. And if I had to pick between the two, right, if I had to say you can only be pragmatic or only be philosophically sound, I am slightly in that pragmatic camp as well. Uh, but this is a fantastic opportunity where actually the philosophically sound argument makes the more pragmatic argument as well, which is that people, regardless of why they went vegan that first time, they're going to stay vegan if we can convince them of the moral, uh, basically the moral importance of the entire argument that animals are not ours to use to begin with. And so, uh, I have a, a closing thought, but before I get there, I did just want to sum up these five points one more time for you. Uh, basically, that we're going to be much more effective in creating lifelong vegans if we make veganism, veganism easy and affordable, if we make sure to pace it properly, if we focus on the numbers of animals that are being killed in the largest amounts, if we make sure to use modern communication techniques, and if we help people in, increase their general concern for farm animals. Those are the five things that are most quickly going to get us to creating more lifelong vegans. Uh, if you want to learn more about the specifics of these items, and again, I do have a couple of closing thoughts after the slide, but if you want to learn more about the specifics of this, there is a talk today at 2.30 in the Juniper Room. It's going to have my colleague Alex Felsinger from Farm. It's going to have Karen Ginsberg, who is making this lovely infographic for us right here. And it's going to have Jenny Messina, uh, the nutritionist and author, talking about addressing barriers to veganism for a full hour. So kind of a meta, a meta version, a uh, bigger version of this talk that I just gave right here. Um, but in, in closing, when we're thinking about this, I can see how this would seem really frustrating, right? And in fact, I had a major donor tell me this. A major donor of ours, basically, uh, uh, you know, of my organization, uh, was frustrated. He said, you know, I, I feel like when people learn this, when they see the reality, you know, when they see the cruelty, when they see what happens to farm animals, that's our job. Our job is to show them what happens and it's not our job to take them the rest of this journey, basically. And I think what he was expressing is this frustration that, you know, we feel like it's one thing if you don't know, right? If you've never learned this, then how could you be expected to go vegan? And then we feel like once you do know, once you've seen this, how could you possibly not? And, and so it's probably really frustrating for us to know that 84, 85% of the people who try going vegan decided it wasn't that important. You know, that eating, that their taste bud preferences were still just a little more important than animals. Uh, it's frustrating. Uh, but actually, I think we need to make sure that we have uh, some of the same compassion for people in this one as we do for animals. What I mean by this is we're asking people to actually do a really revolutionary and radical thing. We're asking people to voluntarily give up their power and privilege over an oppressed being. And that doesn't happen very often in society. That doesn't happen that often. In social justice movements, usually 
the people fighting the hardest for the rights are the people who themselves are experiencing that oppression. And the people who are not experiencing that oppression tend to be on the, on the, more on the sidelines. But we're asking everyone, and it also with other social justice movements in general, most people don't benefit so directly every single day from the oppression of these beings. But in this case, people perceive themselves as benefiting three times a day from animal oppression, and they perceive the beings that they're oppressing as being wildly different from the uh, from themselves. Now, we know this is not true. We know that farmed animals are very similar to us, and we know that we're not really benefiting uh, that much uh, from eating them, if at all. In fact, we're probably being harmed from eating them. But people perceive themselves as getting a big benefit several times a day by hurting a being that's not very much like them and isn't really being hurt that much. And so when we think about that, I think it's remarkable that our arguments work as effectively as they do. I think it's remarkable that everything we do does so much good, and I think we just need to have a little compassion for the idea and keep in mind that we are asking people to do something really amazing, and like Bruce said, we're moving at lightning speed in literally getting this radical shift in the entire idea that it's our, it's our right to basically oppress and own other beings. Uh, so thank you very much.